welcome back everybody. Hope you're all well and you've had a good week. Um, before we get started in our next episode, you may have seen already online that we've actually had a last minute change of name. So we started the podcast calling it the Silver Swan Show, which doesn't actually give a huge amount away. So we've had a last minute change and we've changed it to um, working for the rich and famous which I think, uh, well, just sort of tells you what we're doing, really. However, I do need to stress before people start panicking, um, we're not interested in who you've worked for. Uh, we don't need name dropping. We're not talking about the lives of the rich and famous. What the podcast is focusing on is the careers you can have within the private sector. So what can people expect when working for someone who is rich or someone who is famous? So um, I don't want uh, anyone to get the wrong impression that's going to be some kind of gossipy podcast. I want it to be a really informative podcast, a really helpful podcast, just to sort of inspire others uh, who are wanting to get into the industry or progressing through the industry. So working for the rich and famous, focusing on those careers within the private sector. And we are having a very, very strict no names allowed policy so if anyone by accident mentions who they work for we'll just have to bleep it out or dim it out or something so uh, we're going to avoid at all costs talking about who you've worked for instead we're going to look at um, what you've been doing in your roles highs lows challenges etc etc so let's get started into our next episode and today I'm really pleased to uh, welcome Steph now, Steph's actually uh, part of our team. Steph works with me here at Silver Swan Recruitment. She um, is over in Dubai. She manages our Dubai branch. So she manages all of the recruitment for all of the ultra high net worths over in the UAE. So it's lovely to have somebody on, part of the family. Now, the reason I wanted to get Steph on is uh, before she moved into the world of recruitment, which was end of last year, uh, she had a very, very successful career working in the private aviation industry, working on private jets. So I thought that was quite topical. We have, we've had lots and lots and lots of people approach us over lockdown who have been working in aviation, working as cabin crew on commercial airlines. And obviously, because of um, what's happened with COVID, a lot of people have lost their jobs. So a lot of people at this stage are looking at potentially moving into the private sector. So we are asked a lot at the minute, how can I move into private aviation? What do I need to know? What options are available to me? So I thought it was quite a good timing to talk to Steph now. Uh, Steph started in commercial airlines and then worked her way through and then spent nine years, eight, nine years working on private jets. So welcome Steph, how are you? I'm really good, thank you for having me here. You're welcome, how are you very hot being in Dubai in middle summer stuck in your apartment? Very. <laughs> reaching out to 49 degrees. It is very hot, actually. <laughs> 49 degrees and lockdown. Oof, dude, not, fun. not fun. Well, you've had a day to look forward to, so there you are. <laughs> um, and so, really, I wanted to sort of like start from the beginning, really, and find out a little bit about what your what were you doing before the private aviation, well, before any aviation even sort of came into your mind. What was your life before you got into the industry? Well. Try not to disclose my age at this point, but mm -hmm. literally, when I finished high school, uh, when I was 18, I decided that I wanted to study English uh, properly because at school, the level was very low in my, my mind. So I decided to move to England. I did um, an English course, an intensive English course, and I, at the same time, I was working as an au pair. I, thought, I said to my mom, I'm gonna go three months and be back. Mm -hmm. I came back. I've always had a passion for flying, so as soon as my English was like a decent level, I started applying to all the airlines that, were, that, that I could find. And I managed to get a job with Monarch Airline. That was my first ever proper job. Okay, did you have any like hospitality experience before or any experience, any oh yeah, hospitality experience or just straight from school? I'd work a few, for a few summers in uh, nightclubs, you know, uh, just as a fireman, that's it, but nothing, Nothing specific, to be honest. That's I just story, yeah. applied, applied, applied until Monarch gave an interview, passed the interview, and I started flying there with a temporary contract. Mm, fab, and how long were you doing that for? I stayed with Monarch for about 10 months, and then my contract finished. It was like a um, summer contract that got extended a little bit, but then it terminated, I think it was November. Okay. And then from then, I, of course, I knew that my contract was going to end, so I started applying for other airlines. I, all of them, I've done them all. Virgin, British Airways, you name an airline, I've applied. But my ultimate dream was to fly for Japan Airline, which is national carrier of Japan. 
for two reasons. One, because I've always wanted to go to Japan and I didn't have the money to go. <laughs> and my mom, my mom's sister, she used to fly for Japan Airlines as well. She was one of the first cabin crew, foreign cabin crew that they uh, recruited. So I've always had this passion, curiosity. So I did. I did two interviews with Japan Airlines. The first one I was in uh, Chosen. And then I thought, what can I do to be chosen? It takes commitment when you want something. Yeah. But at that time, I had black hair, really pale makeup, a little like a goth. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so I spent the summer home in Sardinia. And in the meantime, I changed my hair. I changed my makeup. I kind of readjusted to more. Let's put it this way. I hope I'm not like, blowing my own <laughs> chocolate here. But I made myself a little bit more glamorous. Yeah. Just to be able to fit in the criteria a little better. Turns out I go to the interview, second time with Japan Airlines, and yes, I did get the job, but I didn't like my hair, so I had to change my hair again. But that's a story for another time. Uh -huh. I spent nearly uh, eight years working for Japan Airlines. I worked uh, economic class and business class. At that time, you were not allowed to work first class, only Japanese crew could work in first class. But honestly, I loved every minute of it. I been all over Japan, um, the, the trips were long enough for you to be able to travel a little bit, to explore the city. It wasn't just five minutes in, uh, in Tokyo and back, so I was very lucky, I guess. Because when I was in Monarch, the, since I started flying for Monarch, when we did like 10 days trip or two weeks trip, the, of course, the airline industry developed and the trips started getting shorter, shorter and shorter for you to be able to travel kind of hard. After eight years in Japan Airline, I thought I felt that I needed change. I wanted to change for myself. I want something new. And at the same time, there was an amazing company that started. It was called Silverjet. Silverjet was a business class only um, airline based in Luton. They carried uh, just 99 passengers at the time. Uh, so I applied. And having had quite a bit of experience, I managed to get a position as an in flight manager. Um, I spent probably the best three years of my life, <laughs> work-wise in, in relation to airlines, because this airline had a very positive attitude with the customers. It wasn't as strict as normal airlines. We were being more relaxed and the atmosphere was very fun. Yeah. And Silverjet went under and when I knew, we knew it was chasing operation due to, due to the um, cost of fuel, um, I started looking around a little bit. And I realized what was gonna be my next step now. My next step, what would I want it to be? And the only thing that came out of my head, I would like to move to private aviation. This was challenging, I have to say. Um, so I started talking to any contact that I had uh, to be able to find some names, email addresses, where I could actually contact these airlines. At that time, it wasn't as easy as today to get an email address for an airline, for a private airline or a contact. At that time, it was a bit challenging. Yeah. So I was lucky enough to meet this guy that was already working private. They gave me a name. So I had to do a lot of research to be able to find this person and the contact um, for this private airline. Send my CV and I got lucky. I was invited for an interview. Honestly, I did dress up for that interview like I was going to my own wedding. Because uh, I thought, I have one shot, you either have to make a good impression, <laughs> or you're going to be out. And I was lucky enough to get in, and I spent nearly nine years flying private. On private so literally, I think, you know, I think well, the answer to a lot of people's question is how did you get in? It's who are you now, and it's right place, right time, right contact. There's no sort of like magic path oh. into it. And I think the Silver Jets experience is probably really good for you because if that was business only, that's kind of like a stepping stone, really, from the sort of traditional commercial jet into private. So on the business jet, did you have lots of, was it famous people on there? Or was it like, what was the sort of level of clients on there? Silver Jet uh, had, a, yes, a different kind of clientele because um, we had a lot of like, um, groups, famous bands, actors, actresses, they would fly with us for two reasons. Uh, they offer a, a ticket that was literally 999 pounds return, for example, London, New York. Um, 
and also they gave you automatically a flat bed. All the beds were flat beds on 767. So um, it was very appealing to a lot of people. And as we had more than one flight a day, not the beginning, but soon we had more than one flight a day, it was very accessible for a lot of um, famous people, businessmen. So the clientele was a little bit higher, but also allowed somebody, a normal person actually, once in a lifetime, maybe to afford a business class ticket and go to New York and you know, have an amazing experience during the flight. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool. Um, and then Right Place, Right Time was your sort of uh, move into sort of private aviation. So how does it work? So did you have a permanent job, a permanent contract with one principal and you just flew when he flew? Is that how it works or? It just, it depends on the condition of your contract. Every contract um, can be tailored to the needs of the client. Um, I was actually uh, hired to take, play, take um, my role in a private jet for one private client. The plane though was up for charter flights as well. So when the principal wasn't working, sometimes we'd get called to carry other passengers. They would just rent the plane for a day or two or a week, depending on the client's schedule. But basically, the main part of it, I would work just for this client. In private aviation, it's very common that you get some kind of um, a rotation based on two weeks on, two weeks off. So I will go to work and work for two weeks, and then I'll be home in my home base for another two weeks, and another girl will work the other, the, my opposite schedule. Yeah. But as it is very different from a commercial airline, you'll have to really be a flexible person because sometimes if the, if the passengers decide that they want to stay an extra week, you'll stay another week. Uh -huh. There'll be no change in the middle of, you know, in Japan and go back to London or back to wherever you live. Like, you'll have to be very, very flexible. And also, if the other girl, the girl that worked opposite me, she was sick, I would have to cover. So I've done trips for like six weeks or seven weeks at the time. So you get used to it with your suitcase. <laughs> and then you, you, so you fly, say, to Japan um, and you just sort of like wait until they want to fly. Well, they then have like domestic flights or we just have not, not have much to do until they're ready to return. It depends. Um, again, it's more like, for example, if you know the principal is not going to charter the plane, then the time that you have there, it's for you. But the moment you know the principal wants to come back or you have a charter flight, then you have to kind of like, get action going on mm. as you are the responsible person for that plane so you are responsible for everything mm. but everything I mean you'll have to uh, shop for the plane whether it's groceries whether it's decoration uh, flowers chocolate anything that may be needed on the plane it's it's your responsibility to fetch whatever you are even mm. if you're in Japan and you don't speak the language or anywhere else you need to find a way to get things done and the plane ready for your client, whatever, whoever you may be, either your the, the client that you serve normally or for a charter flight, that will be so cool. And just to explain to anybody that doesn't know, a char when you refer to charter, it's when uh, it gets rented to anybody, isn't it? So I, I can go and charter a, a plane tomorrow if I wanted to. So that's what sort of charter, charter means. So um, I suppose that's sort of the, the similar line that you sort of hear from anybody working across any section of the private sector is, you need to be ready at any occasion because you're responsible for everything. It's not as glamorous as you think, you're responsible for everything. And um, you, your boss could, could turn up, couldn't turn up, could turn up with more people, less people. And it's just sort of being, we sort of call it boss ready, just sort of ready for, for anything at any time, I guess. Um, yeah. So talk us through your, the, the role of a private flight attendant. What, is, what are you responsible for? What are your daily duties? So, this man, I try not to get it too long. You're basically, mm every aspect that is the concerns the aircraft. Um, so normally you will go to the plane, depending on the flight time, of course, and the size of the plane, but normally you go to the plane about four hours before, uh, once the pilots open the door, um, you get inside and literally, you take your shoes off, because nobody walks with shoes on the plane, um, put your slippers on, and you clean the plane from top to bottom. Even if you just cleaned it two days ago, you repolish everything. Wow. Um, every single detail has to be covered. I'm, some, I'm sure most people that have flown, um, they didn't, or they've seen pictures of a private jet. You might have realized that the material they are used to make a private jet are quite precious and expensive. So everything has to be touched with gloves, 
you it has to be polished you need to check with the light if there's any marks you know sometimes you wash something there's a mark a watermark there you need to check because that's not allowed that will be like a really bad point for yourself so you have to be very meticulous at the same time you have to offload your shopping on the plane that will include from food items things you might need for the plane because we want to offer the best service so we'll try to find for example the freshest lemons that you can find to the best i don't know depending on the the, the needs of the best the best fruit that you want some board or berries etc and then you practically have to set the plane the the plane ready for your customer um you will prepare from little snacks that we'll get place next to your seat when you boards to whatever water or drink or tea or coffee that you may like has to be ready, has to position the plane in, in a space that is presentable and very elegant. Again, you need to be careful with fingerprints and everything else. You literally wear gloves all the time. Mm. If you prepare all the food for the plane, you print the menus, you decorate the cabin for good flowers, newspapers, anything that you might know about the client, it's useful. So it's good to actually learn to know your client good or even your charter passenger, it's good to take notes. Mm -hmm. So let's say I fly you to, where would you like to go, Philippa? Um, let's go to New York for the weekend. If I take it to New York, yeah. from the moment, if I've never met you before, from the moment you come on board, literally, discreetly, I'll be trying to study you and see what you like or don't like. If you don't touch the newspapers, for example, and you only touch magazine, I will make sure that when I bring you back to London, I will have a bigger selection of magazines. If I see, for example, that you only read, I don't know, Vogue, for example, I will make sure that I have any version of Vogue available that you might like. It's just a lot of it is attention to details. Mm. You kind of want to be invisible, but at the same time, you have to be vigilant so that you can, you know, exceed passenger expectation mm. so you become you know the reliable person on board and you're able to fulfill their needs without being too invasive if i may yeah. say so yeah, yeah so kind of look but you have to keep your discreet side as well and are you the only member of staff in a lot of private jets they have just one flight attendant depend again on the size of the, size of the plane my mm. plane the last plane that i flew on um, I was alone, but I flew on air buses where there'd be like four or five other girls because of the size of the plane. It's yeah. Too much otherwise. Yeah. This will go on as well. So after you, we take off, you start preparing the meals, you take your orders from your customers, and then you have to cook, plate, prepare nicely the meals, you serve the meals. Then you have to hand wash everything. <sighs> A normal standard planes are not dishwashers and the plates are very delicate. Like my previous plane, I had Hermes plates, Hermes glasses. There's no way you could put them in the wash. So you have to hand wash everything. And trust me, it's hard work because you scared yourself breaking a glass. Mm. <laughs> um, again, if the flight goes on, you might have to make a bed, prepare a bed if you asked, or get them slippers or anything they may need. You just have to be ready with anything that may be of use of your customer. The flight continues, you might have a second meal service. If not, after you land, you have to start the procedure backwards. You'll have to strip the beds, you know, clean the cabin. You have to clean the toilet and scrub the toilet yourself. You have to hoover, there's a hoover on board in all the planes. If, you know, think of something that you will do in your own house. If your mother was coming to visit, you'll do it 10 times worse on a private and that's another, at least another three, four hours after you land. Wow. The little details I like to add, depends on the climate as well. For example, if you flew here to Dubai, you'll have to be careful of the items on the plane that you could leave on board and the, the ones you couldn't. You couldn't leave any fruit on board because it would melt and then probably damage either the dish they're using or the furniture. Mm -hmm. Same thing if you flew to Moscow in the winter and it'd be like minus 40, You'll have to be careful not to leave like any bottles on board because it will just freeze and explode. And that, that has happened to me. I forgot a bottle mm. before. And it was like a cascade of champagne frozen. So where do you put all the stuff then? So if, you, if you're away, if you've flown to Moscow and you've got a, a stocked bar, where do you put that stuff? You literally, there are companies, there are catering companies that will allow you to store for a price. Yeah. The good 
somewhere. So you put everything in bags, you lock them up, you seal them, so you re- nobody's going to tamper with. Because some mm-hmm. of the alcohol that you bring on board is very expensive. Yeah. And then before the flight, you upload everything and offload on the plane again. And the magic starts again. All <laughs> on your own. It's hard. So four hours before a flight, the duration of the flight, four hours after the flight, all yourself. It's just, it's not as glamorous as people think. It's hard work, hey? Yes. The good thing is, yes, it is glamorous because uh, you're lucky enough not to wear like a normal airline uniform. Nothing wrong with airline uniform, mm-hmm. but normally you get the choice wearing your own dresses and normally they are designer dress. You get, yes, really fancy bags and shoes. Mm-hmm. But the actual job, it's not as glamorous. You end up literally scrubbing toilets and cleaning everything. Some clients are more uh, considerate than others. But at the end of the day, if you choose to do it, you have to take the good and the bad. It's, if you need to scrub the toilet, you scrub the toilet. Yeah, I bet, I bet. And I think, I think that's sort of similar across all sorts of sectors. There's, I don't know any house manager either that doesn't scrub toilets. Uh, yachts, similar, you know. And so what, if you've got any advice then on um, anybody listening to this who is either not in aviation or is in commercial aviation, have you got any sort of advice um, on how do I get into the industry? How do I get into private aviation? Well, I would very much love to be able to give one simple sentence to say, do this and you'll get in. But unfortunately, there isn't a magic uh, trick to do it. There's no formula. The best uh, advice that I could give them is network with people, get in touch with people without forgetting that your own experience is valuable to the client or the airline we're going to work for. So you also want to work on yourself, the attention to details, the way you present yourself, um, every single details is, is going to be looked mm. from the airline or the client. Mm. The client will ultimately get your file, but before he gets there, he's going to have to pass other people. So the more people you get to know, the more you get to network, the more chances you have contacts to get in. Unfortunately, it's a huge market, but with a very close kind of group of people that decide your faith. Mm-hmm. You do a bunch of luck to get, yeah, to get in, to be honest. Do you think that, because um, we've done, we've done uh, we do some private aviation recruitment, but we often place people um, who are already in the private aviation sector I don't think I've ever placed anybody. No, I've never placed anybody in their first job in the private aviation sector. Do you think that it's fairly impossible for agencies to be the person to get you in? Do you think it needs to be more of a direct application? Uh, as a first effort position, I do think that it's very, very hard to get into private aviation because there are so many factors. Your safety training, which is something that I didn't talk about before, it's a very important part when you work for a normal airline, a commercial airline, or a private airline. So when you go to private, your training, yes, it's still, you still get your safety training done, but it's kind of like a condensed, reduced version of it, where a lot more training is done on service, mm. okay? Because your level has to be sky high. And it is very different than working in business class or first class in a commercial airline. It literally everything is taken to a next step. So I would say, unfortunately, first job getting into private aviation, very, very hard. I just say, yeah, it's a bit like yachting as well, though. It's sort of quite difficult, you know. When you, if someone said to me, "What do I need to get a job on a yacht?" Well, you need experience of working on a yacht. <laughs> well, how do yeah. I get that? And it's the same with aviation. But obviously, people do do it. People do get into it. I think the people that are successful in getting into it are those that are um, persistent. Exactly. And um, don't give up too soon. And like you say, it's all about contacts. And, you know, like with yours, with the Japan Airlines, um, you, you got turned down first time and most people would give up then. But if it's something that you really want to do, you need to look at why you were turned down. I was wondering, I was thinking earlier, when you said that you went back and changed your image, you went back and wondered if they, were you pretending to be somebody else and they'd know it was you. I was banking on that. <laughs> yeah. different hair, different hair, we'll give, we'll give it another go, a pair of glasses. It's important though, if you have to be able to actually, I think, be objective on where we, you went wrong. Maybe you said something weird at the interview. I'm not saying something inappropriate, but I don't know, maybe a sentence wasn't understood well, or maybe the way you present on yourself, maybe, I don't know, your skirt was too short. Mm. Any, it could be anything. So I just thought, I really want to do it. That's my mission. I want to get into this airline. What can I do? So what I, I just tried to reinvent myself to see if the new version of myself, the mm. point, 
was better and it, I was lucky maybe but on the other hand I did work for it yeah. I did study a lot about Japan I got to know more of the culture just in case somebody would ask me a question nobody, nobody asked me anything mm-hmm. but I just wanted to be prepared that's what I mean you have to be persistent but you have to be prepared to work to get to the point that it's going to take you to the job that you want it's not just okay I'm two meters tall and I'm pretty so I should be working in in a private airline it's a lot more there's a lot more that goes into it there's etiquette to study you have to be good in recognizing people needs and reading people without even talking there's a lot of factors but is it a a career you would recommend yes definitely (laughs) but you have to want it because it is hard work it's amazing once you're inside but you have to have that passion for it I knew that I wanted to fly since so I was a child, honestly. You can ask my mom, she'll, she'll confirm it. I always wanted to work in a plane, and that's what I did. But I worked on myself to be able to get there. The same way, even I, my, I got a degree in languages, I knew that my Italian accent was too strong, and I needed to improve myself. So I studied to be able to have, yes, I still have an accent, I understand, but I put myself a list, you know, a step ahead of others that might not have done that. So... If, I think if you're willing to do the work, eventually things are gonna turn out good for you. Yeah, I agree, I agree. You uh, you get out what you put in, as they say. Well, we'll leave it there. I wanna thank you very much for your time. Uh, I hope that people listening to this have found it uh, uh, interesting and informative. I've certainly learned some new things, things I probably should have known, but there we go. And uh, yeah, and hopefully, you know, further down the line, we'll get, you know, other people that are in the sector to come and talk as well. Thank you. No problem. Thank you very much.